everybody, it's Payam here from Niche Advice. In this session, we're going to talk about bridging finance. I've got a whole host of questions here from people that have been reading uh, my, my blogs, um, watching my YouTube videos, and obviously calling in. Um, everything to do with bridging finance, right from the start of how it's being used to the different types of bridging finance, regulated bridging, development finance, second charges, loan to values, um, pricing structures, how long things take. So we talk about all of that. I've put all the questions also in my YouTube uh, uh, description. So you can actually just go to the actual questions if you wanna have a read through it and just, if you click on the link, it will take you to the ex exact section on the video, on the YouTube videos. So I'll catch you there. Hopefully you'll find it useful. Like and subscribe. Also check out my YouTube channel, the Greater YouTube channel. There's uh, over 100 videos now um, there and it's getting a lot of traction. So um, I'll catch you on the video. Take care. All the best. First question. Can you get a bridge if you're a first time buyer? Yes, you can. So you've got to be you've got to be mindful that bridging finance is historically has been set up for more professional people. But fundamentally, bridging was invented um, because people that wanted to sell their property, okay, um, didn't have the time to sell that property or there was an issue with the property. So what they said. To the lenders they said look we're going to sell this property it's already on the market can you let us bridge the gap so we can you know we don't lose on the on the onward purchase so we're bridging the gap between selling and waiting for it to be sold to buying so and normally that was a short-term finance obviously that sort of evolved then it was used for um, auction finances um, where there's time restrictions uh, always okay so um, generally when you go to an auction or th there is some sort of a time restriction that's when bridging finance really is being used um, currently or um, where it's being used is if the property is not up to standard, it's not watertight, or well, I would say watertight, it doesn't have a working bathroom or a kitchen, or it's a bit of a state, and you can't get a traditional mortgage on it. So there are many reasons why bridging finance is being used right now in this market. But yes, as a first time buyer, unlike, uh, and I would say there are more and more lenders coming into the fold on the first time buyer buy to let arena and I've done a video on it which I will leave up there if you're a first time buyer looking get, get into investment property there are opportunities then you can do so but certainly on bridging bridging finance you can do it just depends from project to project okay if you're just going to buy a buy to let uh, on a bridge for whatever reason and then convert that into a buy to let down the road you can do so um, you know if you're going to buy a property and then convert it into an HMO you could potentially do so but the key bit is is how do we get you out of there and that's the that's a much more uh, important point very easy to come on a bridge it's important you come out of the bridge uh, in time in a timely manner without it costing an arm and a leg and i think that's one of the questions that we'll talk uh, talk about in, in the next one um uh, how long does it take for you to take a bridge well the right answer is it depends Sometimes we do bridges very, very quickly, and sometimes, frankly, the clients were better off doing a remortgage. And that's the truth of it. Um, what I would say is, although there's a lot of marketing out there that says bridging finances are very quick, in my experience, they're not as quickly, uh, they're not as quick as they should be, okay? Um, and uh, my experience is particularly the lenders want to lend. I think the legals is, is where the problem normally lies. Norm normally, the legal part takes longer. Uh, and I could be, you know, you can, if you've got experience of having taken bridging, uh, you can obviously leave your comments below. But um, my experience has been, you know, the valuation gets done uh, and there's always an issue with the valuation, whether it's the down valuation and so forth. And we will, I will explain what the, um, the valuation types are in, in the next questions. However, um, yeah, uh, if you're if it's a straightforward deal, if you've done your homework, if all your documentation's done, if there is nothing uh, wrong with the case or there is nothing peculiar with the property, then should be pretty straightforward and and you know very quick. Um, uh, the key bit is, is the legals and that's why it's important you find a solicitor firm or a conveyancing firm that knows what they're doing, that knows 
how to deal with bridging finance. The worst thing you can do, and they will screw up the deal and take the longest, is go and get find yourself a normal conveyancer that says, oh yeah, we do conveyancing for mortgages and bits and pieces, and we could do some bridging. Um, if they're not a specialist, I would steer clear because it just causes more problem. Yes, you'll have to pay more, but it's worth it. Can you uh, buy bridging? Can you get bridging finance in a limited company as well as personal names? Yes, you can. Um, and often there is no difference in regards to pricing. So um, uh, you, will, you will be able to get um, a bridging finance. Normally, there's, if you go live into the company, there's normally a personal guarantee involved as well. So uh, be mindful around that. And you could set up, technically, you could set up a limited company 24 hours before and get lending on that. Ultimately, the limited company uh, side of things it is almost like a tax wrapper because they will still be underwriting the case under the directors. Now, that could be up to four, generally, people on there. Um, what's the standard loan to values on bridging finance? Right. Um, let's explain this because there's a lot of uh, waffle out there. Um, the standard is 75% loan to value, but the standard is not. Don't get it confused with 75% loan to value just like buy to let mortgages. Different story here, right? The way it works with bridging finance generally, and you can, you could either opt to add on your, your interest and all the fees to the loan, or you could service it, okay? If you service it, that means you've got to have the affordability to be able to service that loan. Now, generally, most bridging finance uh, lenders will like to offer the term over 12 months, okay? Uh, and I, I, I actually think that's a good idea. You can get bridging finance for three months and six months, okay? Now, why would someone not take the 12 months and some, why would someone go for a six months? It's because if you're adding it, and I would say majority of the bridging finance, certainly the non-regulated stuff, uh, well, and regulated stuff, it's all been added to the loan, okay? So if you're gonna add the interest rate uh, for 12 months, okay, and then you're adding your lender fee, which is normally 2%, you add that, what happens is that balance from day one is then uh, reduced. So your day one net loan is reduced because you've got all this interest for the next year taken into account. Okay. Now, sometimes clients say, well, I don't quite have that money. I don't quite have the deposit. Um, and I think I'm going to be in and out within three months or six months. Okay. And that's the time where you would say, okay, well, you've got to make sure guys, because if you don't get out of it, you'll probably potentially have penalties to deal with and going over your term is an issue. And, and unfortunately, people are very optimistic. Everyone thinks, oh, I'm going to turn this project around really quickly. And then all of a sudden, builders don't turn up in time, material costs go through the roof. You know, there are problems, you know, planning permission takes longer. So um, I would always go on the side of caution, um, go for a 12 months bridge. Generally, most bridging lenders don't have an early repayment charge after the first month, or if they do, they will obviously you need to uh, have a discussion with your broker. Uh, and I would say it's always good to go with the broker because the broker will have an understanding of what their positions are. But this is why it's not quite 75%. On a buy to let mortgage, 75% loan to value, you put your 25% deposit down, that's it. However, on bridging finance, when they say 75%, it usually reduces to, you know, after the cost of maybe 60, 70, 70%, 72%, whatever it is, depending on the loan sizes. Something else to watch out from is, um, actually, I've got that on the, on, I've, I'll put it here, I've got it on the, um, one of the questions is around what are they basing this? Let's just talk about it now. What are they basing this 75% on? Now, this is the trick bit, okay? This is the bit that they don't put on the websites for you, right? They don't tell you that on their brochures. They don't tell you that often when you phone them up. And that's on what basis are they valuing the property? Um, now, um, a normal mortgage is valued when the valuer goes around there, when the surveyor goes around there, is valued based on the open market. How much would this properly be if I sold it onto the market? Or how much would they value it based on that? A lot of bridging lenders don't actually use that calculation. They actually use the 180-day resale value. Now, on a market which is going up and it's a buoyant market, there's not much difference. Certainly when I've, I've found in a lower property values, there's not that much difference. Maybe about 5% difference though. But when you're dealing with the high end properties, often that could be problematic. So um, that 180 day resale value compared to the open market value can be the difference of 5%, can be 50K, can be 100K depending on the loan size, okay? Can be 10,000 pounds. 
Um, so you've just got to be mindful that different lenders operate differently. If you're going down the adverse range or you're going down the commercial range, often it's quite normal for lenders to do it on 180. Sometimes if it's really sort of adversey, 90-day resale or commercial uh, or, or it's a non-standard type, 90-day resale value. So big differences on that 75%. So don't be fooled when they go, we do 75%. 75% on what basis? That's the question you need to be asking. Um, right, what's the difference between a regulated bridge and an unregulated bridge? Now, I've explained this in my other videos. Um, <clears throat> fundamentally, a regulated bridge is a, a bridging finance which is being used or it's, it's going to be used or has been used for your residential purposes or a family living there. So that's classed as a regulated bridge. So I'll give you a perfect example. I'm looking to develop my current residential home. I'm looking to, <clears throat> I don't know, split it into two, two flats or I live in one um, I, I, or I'm going to, uh, you know, I've lived in this other property and now I'm going to convert it into an HMO or something. That sometimes falls or I'm going to convert my property into a HMO. That falls under the regulated environment what that means is it falls under the financial conduct authorities remit there are additional checks that need to be done and lenders will often uh, have specific um, products on that um, so for example uh, one of the rules that's across the board i think with the majority of lenders is they will insist that you add the interest on the loan and the term of the um, bridging finance cannot be longer than 12 months okay so um, there are lots and lots of other scenarios where it falls if you've inherited a property it falls under consumer by uh, consumer and then falls under regulated so there are lots and lots of different rules in round regulation regulation uh, regulated environment more affordability checks sometimes with different lenders uh, a, a more stringent approach because it's not a commercial property as such you're going to be converting it into a commercial property or you may have it as a residential so that perfect example of i need to sell my property to buy a new property so i'm going to move into this new property that's a regulated bridge because it was your residential and you're buying a new residential okay now how does that different the different things well a lot of brokers a lot of buy to let brokers and the, the ones that deal with commercial stuff are not actually authorized to deal with regulated bridging okay so that's one and that goes the same with a lot of the lenders that are out there a lot of bridging lenders are not actually regulated to give uh, that type of uh, product okay um, so um, let's just say there's a hundred bridging lenders out there there may be only 15 of them that will do regulated bridging lenders and what you will find is those lenders are generally the larger lenders there are one or two lenders that do regulated that are quite small and quite niche I suppose but majority of them what you'll find is they're either mortgage lenders or that do bridging or they're banks that do bridging so um, uh, and, it, and careful consideration needs to be given for regulated transaction so it's almost very very important to speak to brokers like niche advice but there are many great brokers out there that could give you that advice around it and always seek independent advice what's a second charge bridge what's the difference between a first charge bridge and a second charge bridge um right so second charge bridge is essentially what you're doing is you're going to keep the existing mortgage funding uh, on the property and then you're looking to raise additional funding right so instead of let's just say you've got a property worth five hundred thousand pounds you've got i don't know one hundred and fifty thousand pounds mortgage on it but you want to raise another 100k to do an extension or to buy another building or something buy somewhere else in an auction so often what will what it looks like is look it doesn't make sense for somebody to bridge you the 250,000 okay where you're paying a, I don't know a 3% interest rate on a normal mortgage okay so uh, the correct uh, way is, is is almost looking at it and going right does it make sense to stay with that existing lender for the first 150 because you're only paying three percent and only borrow what you need on this expensive bridging finance right so that's where it's quite nice to get a second charge put in now there are some caveats to this it all sounds great but the first charge lender may not give consent for the second charge right so that's problematic sometimes um, although there are there is a solution there is a solution where some lenders may be able to do an equitable charge what that means is 
even if the existing lender doesn't give you the uh, permission, you could still get a charge. You could still get a second charge on it. So there are some lenders that will do that. So that's good. Probably cost you a little bit more. But more importantly, what you will find is second charge lenders, typically they'll only do 65% loan to value. There are one or two that will do 70%. So 65 is the norm loan to value. So you've got to have equity in that property if you're going to do to put a second charge in there. Right. So um, again, it's a bridge rather than a secured loan. A secured loan is a long term funding solution. OK, so it's still a second charge, but secure loan is really for long term. You want the secure loan for more than 12 months. Right. A bridge is, look, I need to bridge the gap. I need the money quickly and I need the money to be paid back. Quickly. I'm going to pay back the money quickly. However, I need you to bridge the gap. Hence, you put a second charge bridge rather than a second charge secured loan. Um, so hopefully I've explained that. Can you do a no money down deal on bridging finance? I've seen it done. Uh, I've, I've t uh, well, they've said I've seen it done before on the Internet. Well, in theory, yes, we just touched on it, actually, a second charge. So the last no money down deal that I did. Um, and when I mean when, when they say no money down, you've got to have some equity there. Right. So it's not 100 percent lending. But the way it works uh, around it is um, uh, the scenario of I had a chap who wanted to buy a property, but his property, in, in fact, we were selling his father's property, one of his buy-to-lets, dad's buy-to-let property, worth £700,000. There was an issue, there was a legal issue where the tenant was an, I think, ex-local authority tenant, and the tenant would not move. So they had to go through the courts to get the various permissions to actually evict the tenant. In the meantime, he wanted to buy a property. So the dad was going to sell this property, gift the money to the son so the son could buy the property. Unfortunately, the problem the problem is where the tenant would not move. So they had to go through the courts. That was going to take six months, 12 months, whatever, six months at least. So we bridged it. We bridged that property. Um, and then, uh, so there was no money because they had, basically we took a charge on the existing property that was going to be sold as well as the new property that was going to be bought. There was plenty of equity in there. So essentially there was no money down. Right. So that bridged the gap. So that's the way no money man, no, no money down deals are. They used to be historically, if you could get a really good deal, really good deal, say the property was worth 300,000 all day long and you picked it up for 250. You could use the 50K equity in the deal uh, for it to work. And in theory, there are still lenders that will do that. But what they would want you is they would want you to contribute at least 10 percent uh, of the purchase price into the deal so even if you're going to get it uh, uh, discounted they will use most of the discount but you still need to put some skin in the game they want you to put some skin in the game so those are the ideas around that what's the biggest problems that you see with bridging well by a mile um people not thinking about the exit this is the biggest problem that i see people being optimistic with build cost time frames and not thinking about the exit I'll give you the example. Example is, client buys a property, but is not in a position to be a buy-to-let landlord. So their exit is refinanced. Now, they've told the lender it's going to be a sale, um, for whatever reason. They've said, we're going to sell it, and then they change their mind. Or um, uh, they were told it was, going to be, um, it was going to be easier to go down the sale route for the exit because they, had, they didn't have the right experience to be a landlord. And then they want to, go, uh, they want to do a buy-to-let. Now, or, or more importantly, HMO, um, this, this becomes problematic because their credit profile may not be right, their income profile may not be right, um, so um, their status, I've had people that are foreign nationals on a visa, first time buyer, first time landlord, all sorts of things, there could be problems around that, okay, so um, by my, what I would say is, one, uh, not thinking about the exit, two, being optimistic with the price, three, not having enough money um, if things go wrong. And, and I, th I think everybody's trying to cut things too tight. They want the maximum loan to value. They want the cheapest rate. They want the shortest time because they don't want to put as much money down. They don't have enough money to fall back on. They don't have the right experience. So what you've said, that these are all disastrous. When I, when I see one come through like this, I just say, look, you know, you've got to, you've got to do something here. You can't push on all fronts. If you're going to push on the loan to value, push on that bit, but have some money in the background. If you're going to push on the building time and the cost, 
push on that bit. But don't do all of that at the, at the same time. And often, unfortunately, I get calls from these type of clients. Um, and, you know, we try to try our best, but, you know, they've got themselves in this mess. And and, and obviously speak to lots of people. Um, some people, again, um, are too optimistic with their pricings and, 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 and service levels and promises as well. Um, What's the typical cost for bridging finance? Well, <clears throat> again, it's to do with the deal itself, but what I would say is loan to values, because it's very much property related, loan to values dictate the costs, okay? So, you know, 75% loan to value, you know, you're looking at between 0 0.68 to 0 0.75 on the rates. Um, but, you know, if you go down the, down the you know, under 50% loan to value, you'll certainly get, you know, 0 0.45, 0 0.48. So it really is dependent on uh, the loan to value and the type of client you are. Um, with some of the lenders, you know, it does make a difference if you've done this before. Uh, it does make a difference on the loan sizes you want to do. So if you're somebody who's never done a project before and you're now asking for £500,000, they're going to be worried about it. And some lenders, the more vanilla, better price lenders, may not do the deal. So it depends on where you are. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, there are lots of lenders. I had, I had this once from a, a very leading sort of industry guy um, in bridging finance. And he, he was a head of a lender who were very well priced lender. You know, what you would call as a very vanilla lender. And he said, I can't understand why, you know, anybody would use anybody else apart from us we've got the best products out there <clears throat> okay but then he he was thinking because he came from a mortgage background he was coming from well i've got the best rate uh, i've got the best product why why wouldn't you come to me well there's lots of reasons why there are lots of lenders out there there's lots of reasons why there's lots of smaller lenders out there for that particular lender for example they didn't do any commercial bridging so that was one okay at the time they wanted to see experience by landlord that was another one okay at the time they were not very big on heavy refurbishment they only wanted to do the light bridging side that was another one at the time they were not very good at taking quite a lot of heavy adverse if there was problems in the background maybe bigger issues than just like missed payments they didn't they didn't do that at the time they were not comfortable with certain exit strategies they were not comfortable with certain types of properties that were going to be converted so these are all reasons why you would go to the other lenders okay um, they may not have been comfortable with uh, the the client profiles for example they may not be comfortable with their with their background of what they've done they may not be comfortable with that type of property so and this is where other lenders come to the fold okay i'll give you an example there are lenders out there like i've mentioned that could work if you're getting a good discount they could use up to 90 percent of that discount well that particular lender didn't they wanted the full deposit coming from the client okay um so they would take you know that i'm just i'm just doing one at the moment and the lender is they've got an adverse range where they could deal with adverse clients on a bridge if they're going to sell their property i've got one right now clients sending you their buy to let He's had adverse, he's had missed mortgage payments in the past, so uh, potentially this lender could look at it, whereas others will say no. So those are the, these are the reasons. So what's the pricing? It depends on you and what you're looking to do, your loan to value, your property values, and, and where we can go with the lender. And this, as, um, that's what a good broker will do. A good broker has got an understanding about who you are, where you fit within this model okay and and not recommend the same lender all the time because that's that's wrong really and, and that's not best for the client um all right what's the difference between bridging finance and development finance um more and more we're getting clients that are looking to do things okay now <clears throat> the simplest way i would say is um if the property is water and wind tight you could potentially get bridging finance okay rather than development finance development finance is generally if you're building ground up okay and now the, the advantages of uh, development finance is you can actually um, schedule the payments into stages okay so the foundations have been built here's that payment as you're adding value and development finance a lot obviously can be taken uh, out for a longer period depending on the, the the time scale of the development costs okay 
development finance generally you will need uh, a lot of the lenders want to see some a level of experience that you've done something in the past not all but I would say in the majority of them you will do and it's not necessarily the case with bridging finance um, some bridging finance le companies have got various um, options so they've got a light refurbishment product um, they may have a light refurbishment into a buy to let product then they've got a medium refurbishment and a heavy refurbishment where planning permissions and things like that is granted so that's it and then they've got a development finance range what I would also say is <clears throat> development finance is generally larger loans doesn't always have to be but it really it, it really does depend on the project that you're doing so in the past we've done um, uh, you know where there was a shop and then they were going to build six or seven flats on top of that shop uh, and development finance had to be taken to do the build what you would have to do typically is take out the first charge if there is a first charge on the on the shop element uh, and the lender will then give you one big lending for the whole project and then what would happen is once the development is being completed then there will be a you would flip that into a more of a term loan a commercial uh, a, a loan as such uh, or you could split the titles up and go and buy to let separate ways but that could be problematic um, that's about it guys like I said you know we've been doing bridging finance for many many years I've done several videos on this topic there are more detailed videos about bridging um, so do check out my channel just put bridging finance niche advice and you will probably see them there let me know what you think let me know if you've got any questions uh, and I will try to sort of do follow-up videos on this I'll catch you on the next one take care all the best The content of this video does not constitute giving advice. It's purely for information purposes. All cases should be discussed with a professional mortgage broker. As a mortgage is secured against your home or property, it could be repossessed if you do not keep up mortgage payments. Niche advice is authorized and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority.